Well, good morning, Grace Place family. It's so good to be with you today. Welcome to our online sermon video. Real quick, we're going to go ahead and go over the offering. You're going to see a slide right now that explains the different ways that you can give if you're participating in church uh, from at home watching our videos. You'll see there the church address that you can use uh, to mail us your tithe and offering, or you can take that address and you can plug it into your online banking and they can mail us a check on your behalf. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you for everyone that's watching right now and I just pray that you would bless them and that you would bless the gift that's about to be given, Father, and that you would multiply it for your kingdom's sake and that you would continue to bless this church and bless all of our missionaries as they are stationed all over the globe. In your precious and holy name, amen, amen. All right, church, well, without further ado, it's my pleasure to present your lead pastor, Wes Beam. I'd like to welcome everybody to church today. It is so good to get to spend some time with you and share from God's Word. I'm so uh, blessed to get to do this each week. I will say that um, it was uh, good to uh, just uh, see how the Lord uh, ministered through Pastor Lincoln last week, and I just appreciate his heart. He, he actually leads our, our young adult ministry and gave him an opportunity to fill the pulpit, and he did such an admirable job. I'm proud of him and, and uh, just so grateful that he could be a part of this series, and, uh, but it's good to be back and just to get to share my heart with you and, and uh, what the Lord is, has been laying on my heart. And we're in a series called The Cross, and this is part four. And I want to pray and just ask the Lord to, um, to be with us. But before I do that, I just want to take a moment and encourage you um, to just, in spite of all that is happening around us, to always stay focused on what God wants to do in us. I, th I think that is so important. And I, I was thinking just in praying this morning about where the church is at and, and where I believe God is wanting to lead us. And one of the things that I feel uh, just a, a sense of in my heart is that um, God is, is wanting to bring us back into uh, just a, a, a real understanding of who He is and understanding the work of the cross, understanding Jesus, understanding the Holy Spirit. And so um, that's just been kind of heavy on me in a good way um, this morning. And I think that's where the church is headed because um, where I believe we're going, we need a fresh revelation of Jesus. And, and it, that kind of helps us to realign what we do and how we live. And, and uh, so I, I just want to encourage you with that and, and uh, let this be a season where you uh, just come into a, a greater knowledge, a greater knowing of who God is. And not, not just that he's a God who's you know, far away or he's in heaven and, 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 and those types of things. But, uh, and we know he, he, he's there and, he, and we know Jesus is preparing a place. We know the Holy Spirit's with us. We understand all of that. But to know that we can have this personal connection with a God who loves us. And so I just want to encourage you in that today just before I pray and we get in the word. So Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to share um, from the Word of God today, the, the Word, the Word that is life, uh, the Word that can change us, that God can, can challenge us, even convict us to draw us closer to you. And Father, I pray just a, a special, precious anointing would rest over my life today. And God, for everyone that will be listening to the message today, encourage and bless and strengthen. In Jesus' name, I give you praise. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing to talk about the cross. And um, as I'm getting into the sermon today, I want to uh, encourage you as we think about how we're going to end to think about communion. We're going to be taking communion together, and you might uh, be somewhere there in your home where you can even be listening to me as I introduce this message, and you can, you can find some juice and a cracker, or uh, you know, if you don't have any juice, uh, find, you know, get some water, uh, some bread, you know, something, some, a cracker that you can, you, can, we, you can join with us, and we can have this communion time together as we celebrate um, what the cross means to us. And so we're going to talk about it at the end of the, at the, end of the message, but I want, to, I want to just encourage you today to stay focused on what this series is all about. And it is about the cross. And I pray that we would have a, a greater understanding as, as we walk through this of the significance of the cross on our lives and in our lives. And when I think about the cross, I think it is, isn't it amazing that, that an instrument of execution is what we look at. 
You see, the cross was what the Romans used to execute criminals, and now we see it as a symbol of our faith. Isn't it amazing how God can, can, can take things and, and, and change the meaning to give him glory and, and use something maybe the world has looked at in one way, and God can use that as, as, a, as an instrument of his glory? And so my prayer is that we will have a, a greater understanding in this series of what the message of the cross really means to you and I. And so uh, we're, we're going into this week and, and we're uh, celebrating Palm Sunday and we're walking into what we uh, know as the Passion Week. And, and I, I pray that even this week would, would, would gain a greater significance in your heart as we uh, understand what happened over 2,000 years ago and it would, uh, it would just impact us today in a fresh new way. And we would, we would even have an understanding of how it impacts us uh, throughout eternity, because it's, it's during this week of passion that, that Jesus walked through, that he laid his life down so that you and I could have uh, just an eternal destiny. We could be born again, as the Bible says. We could be saved. We could know that our, our, our eternity is, is in heaven with Jesus. And so uh, let's be mindful of that as we open God's word today. I want to read First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. I read this two weeks ago as we talked about redemption. And this week is, is kind of partnering with that sermon. Of course, Lincoln last week bridged that as he talked about uh, that storm and those disciples with Jesus and how the cross makes a difference. I love how he ended that sermon. But I want to go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 through 21. It says, For you know that you were not redeemed from your spot, your, for you know that you were not redeemed from your useless, spiritually unproductive way of life, inherited by tradition from your forefathers with perishable things like silver and gold. But you were actually purchased. And this is so critical to this message. You were purchased. There was a price that was paid. It says, with precious blood, like that of a sacrificial lamb, unblemished and spotless, the priceless blood of Christ. For he was foreordained or foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared publicly in these last times for your sake. Now, I could stop and get excited and preach right there for a while to, to, to think about Jesus came to this world and died for me. It is a personal gospel, and it was for my sake, and it was for your sake. And through him, you believe confidently in God, the heavenly Father who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are centered and rest in God. And so today on this Palm Sunday day, I want to I wanna talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and, and my sermon title is just very simple. It's just the crucifixion. And so I'm going to take some time today, and I'm going to open the Word of God, and I want to talk about the crucifixion. And uh, the word crucifixion actually comes from a, a Latin word, which means to be fixed to a cross. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And I want to I wanna just kind of uh, unwrap this today through the context of three pertinent questions concerning the crucifixion. And so I want to just begin to, to lay these questions out, and I'm going to take the Word of God, and I want to uh, use the Word to address these questions. And the first question is this. It's simply, how did that happen? How did that happen? How did we get to the point where, where, where Jesus was, was, was crucified? And, and what did that look like? And as you follow Jesus through the Gospels, you'll find that as a result of his ministry, he became quite popular. And as the miracles increased, and, and this is quite natural, the, the crowds increased, and, and uh, he taught the people. He fed the people. And I thought about that when he became hungry. He covered everybody's lunch by multiplying bread and fish. He raised the dead. And, and you can read uh, the stories in, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can read the stories of, of Jesus performing all of those miracles. He healed the lepers. He brought deliverance from demonic power, the lame walk. And without the aid of media as we know it, he became famous and well-known. I wonder how many followers that Jesus would have had in, in today's time frame if there would have been social media, if he were walking the earth today. He probably would have, would have had one of the largest uh, accounts that anyone could have on social media because his fame was known throughout all the regions. And so as we go into this week of passion, I want to look at John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. 
It says the next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. So Jesus is getting ready to go into Jerusalem. He's getting ready to uh, lay his life down, and, and he has been preparing his disciples for, for this moment, even though they were struggling with the understanding of it all. But it says a large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. And so what is so interesting about the context of this this story and where we pick it up is we find Jesus going into the city, knowing in his own heart that he's going to be laying his life down. But we see a crowd of people crying out to him and reaching out to him and receiving him as a king. And they, they, they say the very words, hail to the king of Israel. And have you ever been in a situation where you thought what was going to happen didn't happen? Like there was this great expectation over the people. And, and, and Lincoln even touched on that last week when the disciples were in the boat. That there was this expectation. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. And, and they didn't realize the storm was going to happen. And so the, the, the story took on a whole different turn and, and, and twist than what they had expected. And that's what we're going to see in this story. It, it's, it's somewhat the same principle as they are, are, are going into the city. They're crying out and they're, they're going to, to, to think in, in their hearts and minds that they're going to, to receive him as the king. And uh, I thought about this in the context of how sometimes life can be very interesting. And, and uh, have you ever rode by something or, or saw something you thought, how did that get there? <clears throat> how did that happen? And I was reminded of a number of years ago, uh, actually uh, on this property in our parking lot, we had a, have a church trailer, it's an enclosed trailer. And um, there was a spare tire that <coughs> I was putting in the back of the trailer where the trailer wasn't hooked up on a vehicle. And so the tongue was resting on top of a, you know, a block or a, or a board or something like that. And so it was, it was actually at the far end of the parking lot and there's a retaining wall and a concrete wall. And, it, and on the other side of that wall, it's multiple feet down to the ground. And there's only just a small lip from the pavement to the top of that wall. And so when I lowered the, the, the back door of that trailer and I stepped into the trailer to roll the tire in, the front of the trailer, because of my weight, came up in the air, the tongue of the trailer, and it actually caused the trailer to go across the top of the wall, and the trailer was like teeter-tottering on top of the wall, and I'm inside the trailer, and it wasn't a good feeling. And when I came outside, I looked at it and I thought, if somebody drives by, they're going to ask me, they're going to look at that and think to themselves or ask me, how in the world did that happen? And it was so funny because we had a church event going on and there was an elderly lady that was leaving the church and she drove by me and she, she rolled her window down and she, she, she um, spoke to me and she said, I could have done that. And she just kept on going out of the parking lot. And so here I was in this dilemma. And what she was saying was, I have no idea, I don't know very little about trailers, but what you did, I could have done that. Like, that's not very bright. And so I remember people coming by to help me. And they're like, how in the world did that happen? And uh, because if you didn't see it happen, it, it would be hard to comprehend. And, and that's kind of what we see in this story. There, there's something about to happen that we could have never imagined happen. And when we see it or those who saw it on that day or, or those days begin to, to comprehend, I, I believe that it was, would be difficult because it's something they never imagined could have happened. And, and there are all kinds of experiences in our lives where we could, we could ask that question, how did that happen? We learned last week that there are seasons in our lives where life can be unexplainable and we find ourselves again saying, I wonder what happened or how did that happen? Or I had a certain expectation and the result is not what I got. So let's fast forward to Mark 15. And we're, we're going to see that by the reception Jesus was getting uh, from the word, the scripture that I read earlier, that, that he, you would imagine he was headed toward a coronation when he was re- really in reality headed toward his, his death. And so I want to pick up Mark chapter 15, and I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, just what Mark has to say about Jesus being brought to this place called Golgotha. 
And uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, passage of Scripture that talks about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then we're going to unpack some more of this story today. But in Mark chapter 15, verse 22 through 28, it says, They brought Jesus to the execution site called Golgotha, which means Skull Hill. There they offered him a mild painkiller, a drink of wine mixed with gall, but he refused to drink it. They nailed his hands and feet to the cross. The soldiers divided his clothing among themselves by rolling dice to see who would win them. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they finally crucified him. Above his head, they placed a sign with the inscription of the charge against him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. Two criminals were also crucified with Jesus, one on each side of him. This fulfilled the scripture that says he was considered to be a criminal. So if you were to go back to uh, the context of the scripture uh, from John chapter 12 and read of, of Jesus' entry in Jerusalem, it would be so within reason as you get to Mark chapter 15 just a few days later and you read where Jesus was being nailed to a cross that it would be uh, such a valid question to ask, how did that happen? How did Jesus go from being hailed as this, this king by, by those who were shouting and, and laying down the palm branches to now he is nailed to a cross and he's giving his very life? It took an unexpected turn. But so to understand how it happened, I believe it's important to understand why it happened. When we understand why the crucifixion happened, it, it gives us this, this, this conceptual uh, process of knowing why Jesus died on the cross and how it happened. So the second question is this, why did it happen? And to understand why it happened, you've got to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And, and if I can just, just uh, reflect on uh, uh, several sermons ago where we talked about the fatal choice that was made and how, how Adam and Eve had sinned. And because of sin, we are now all affected by sin because of their sin. In Colossians 1.21, it says, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. And so the reason why Jesus came, and we're going we're gonna to unpack this because this is just a simple message of the cross, and there is a, a, a messianic thread that goes throughout the word of God that leads us to the cross. There are, there are prophetic words that we read as we open the gospels and the word of God that begin to, to unveil to us the reason why Jesus came and the promise of God that we, you and I, could receive salvation. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, it says, you can rationalize it all you want and justify the path of error you've chosen, but you'll find out in the end that you took the road to destruction. So there are these choices that we make, and those choices cause us to be headed down a wrong path. And that is why we need the cross, and that is why we need a Savior. You see, this is so critical to our Christian faith because we need to understand today we can go in and out of a church building. We can sing songs, whether it be from a hymn book or, or we sing them from a, a screen on the, on the wall at the church or, or whatever that may be. We may listen to Chris, Christian music. We may do good things and, and all of those things are wonderful. But if we don't understand the need for a relationship with God through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, we've missed the whole point of the gospel. There was a reason why it had to happen. And when you understand the reason why, you can then reconcile in your heart how it happened, how Jesus laid his life down. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses four through six. It says, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. This is so humbling for me to think that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for me. That Jesus cared enough for my eternal soul that he would come and he would be broken and crushed and bruised so that I could have hope and I could have life. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we would be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of it all. That's why it had to happen, because God needed to take care of the sin issue. And we learned last week that when you go into the Old Testament, we see the, the sacrifices covered the sin. The sacrifice, it just look, was a way of looking forward to a better way. There, there was just this, this, this way that God provided in the Old Testament that is so different now. And we learned that, that there is a 
better way through Jesus. There is a better way. And what Jesus did for you and I couldn't have been been done through the sacrificial process of the Old Testament because what Jesus did brought finality once and for all. And so it's so important to understand that. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 20, Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem. And this is before he went. It says, so he took his 12 disciples aside privately and said to them, listen to me. We're going on our way to Jerusalem, and I need to remind you, and this is so important because I think Jesus wanted them to understand that when I go into that city, they're going to be trying to to, to, uh, influence me and you and those that I've been teaching. There's going to be this crowd noise that you're going to listen to and the perception you're going to to be tempted to to perceive in your own heart, and, and, and what you're going to be tempted to grab a hold of is not the reality of why I'm here or why I came. He said, listen to me, we're going on our way to Jerusalem. I need to remind you that the Son of Man will be handed over to the religious leaders and scholars, and they will sentence him to be executed, and they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, tortured, and crucified. Yet, and we're going to get this next week, three days later, he will be raised to life again. And then look at Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Peter continued, people of Israel. Now, Peter is preaching a sermon in Acts 2. Let me set the context of this. Jesus has died on the cross. He's rose again. He's ascended. And, and the Holy Spirit comes and falls upon the church, those that are gathered. And, and the church is, is born and birthed. And Peter is preaching. He says, people of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus, the victorious, was a man of divine mission whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed many miracle, powerful miracles, signs and wonders through him. This man's destiny was prearranged. This is why it had to happen, because God had already arranged for Jesus to come and be the Savior of the world. For God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified, and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of the lawless men. Yet it was all part of his predetermined plan. God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up, because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. This is so important for you to understand today. That Jesus did not have his life taken from him. He willingly gave his life so that we could have life. That is what's so important to understand as we talk about the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior is that he willingly laid down his life for you and I. And this is what is so powerful about the cross, that that Jesus did not have to go. As a matter of fact, the word declares that he could have called for help. He could have called and he could have, he had the power to, to, to come off of that cross, but he willingly gave himself for you and I. And I don't know about you, but that empowers me. That, that, that gives me a, a greater passion to know God and serve God. How could anyone, how could our Savior especially lay his life down so that I could go free, so that I could, go, could be forgiven? Let's talk about uh, crucifixion just for a moment. When you study crucifixion, you find it's the most beautiful, uh, it's the most brutal, it's the most brutal torture that could ever happen to anyone. Prior to the crucifixion, the Bible tells us that Jesus was scourged. I'd encourage you, and I, I uh, know that many of you have probably watched The Passion of the Christ to watch that movie, and it's, it's, it's very graphic as it lays out what would have happened to Jesus as he gave his life. And, and I, I thought about this several years ago as I was preaching on the cross. I thought about what Jesus walked through. Isn't it interesting that God chose that period of time when I believe the most bu- brutal way that you could ever be executed was by crucifixion, where you would suffer in, in, in such a dire way that that was the, the, the time period that God chose to send Jesus into this world. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says that a, a, a leather whip was used. And as you begin to study that, that whip out as Jesus was, was beaten, 39 stripes he bore on his back. That, that whip had strands that would have had stone and metal tied to them. And, and that was what was used to beat Jesus. And the scourging was so severe that the victim would be nearing death as a result of being beaten. And then Jesus was forced to carry his own cross through the streets. And and we know the Bible talks about how he got some help along the way. But upon his arrival at the place of crucifixion, they laid him on the ground and large spikes were, (coughs) were driven into his hands and feet. And one of the things that I think about is how difficult it would have been once they tilted that, that cross up, up into that hole. And, and I can imagine his body being jarred as, as that cross would, would have been uh, driven into the ground. And, and Jesus would have felt the weight of all of that as his hands and feet had been nailed 
to the cross. And as you study the, 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 the timeline of, of the crucifixion, we understand that he was nailed to the cross at about nine o'clock in the morning, died at three in the afternoon. And it was this gruesome, horrific sight as Jesus became our sacrificial lamb, as Jesus gave his life so that his blood would be the sacrifice for your sins and my sins. And I think about what he must have gone through as they, they put a crown of thorns on his head and as they, they, they spat on him and as they mocked him and they ridiculed him and as they, they abused his, his body and, and all that he went through so that you and I could have eternal life. I'm so grateful for, uh, today for the, for the cross and for the crucifixion and what it means to me. And I, I want to encourage you to be thankful. I want to encourage you, even maybe in this moment, to just stop and say, God, I am thankful. I am thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. I am so thankful for uh, the fact that he gave his life. And I think one of the things that would have been, in my, in my mind, so difficult for Jesus to bear was not only did, did he have to bear the sins of the world, and the word of God says that, that, that he was forsaken, that, that he cried out to God and said, God, as those sins, all of our sins were being placed on him, this one man, Jesus, all of our sins, the sins of the world. And he cried out to God and he said, God, why have you forsaken me? And he's crying out to God because for in that moment, he could not feel the presence of his heavenly father in his life as he bore the sins of the world. And then to think about how his followers, those who had walked so close with him, one of them had betrayed him and gave him up as he was arrested. And, and those that had run away from him and that had left him, and, and I'm sure that, that just that feeling of, of being all alone would have been so difficult to bear, would have been one of the most difficult things to bear outside of the pain that he was bearing in his body in that moment. And I think about the, that, those moments and those hours and what that must have seemed like to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a great motivation to want to serve him and to know him. And again, to think, why would he do that? Why would Jesus give his life so that I could have life? Think about you know, people that we have friendships and relationships with that, that, that we're around on a daily basis. I wonder if they would do that for us. I wonder if we would be willing to, to, to give so much for someone else. And I pray that, that we would have a love for others in our heart because the word of God says that we're supposed to care for one another. But to think of what Jesus did, to think about how he laid himself down and gave it all is so amazing. Now, this is the third question. And then we're going to go into communion. I pray communion will have a great impact on your life today. But the third question is, how does, this, how does what happened affect my life? How does this change my life? First of all, I'm not sure what your expectation of Christianity was. Maybe once you came to Christ, it's so different than what you thought it would be. But as you've gotten closer to the Lord, you begin to understand the why. You begin to understand uh, how God's love can consume you and how you can grow and how God's ways are higher than our ways. But how does this affect my life? Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 21 to 25. For in his wisdom, God designed that all the world's wisdom would be insufficient to lead people to the discovery of himself. He took great delight in baffling the wisdom of the world by using the simplicity of teaching the story of the cross in order to save those who believe in it. So, so this is what is so neat about the gospel. God used the simplicity of the death of Jesus on the cross to cause us to understand and to know him. And, and it baffles the wisdom of the world. Why would God do that? For the Jews constantly demand to see miraculous signs, while those who are not Jews constantly cling to the world's wisdom. But we preach the crucified Messiah. The Jews stumble over him, and the rest of the world sees him as foolishness. But for those who have been chosen to follow him, both Jews and Greeks, and I love this, he is God's mighty power, God's true wisdom, and our Messiah. He is my Messiah today. He is my Savior today. For the foolish things of God have proven to be wiser than human wisdom, and the feeble things of God have been proven to be far more powerful than any human being. So what is the cause and effect of all of this? Think about this. I now am called to partner with Jesus and bear his cross. I become a, a part of what, what Jesus did as I, I come into fellowship and relationship. And this is, this is what is so important about understanding the cross is that now I can embrace the same heart that Jesus had when he was willing to, to, to move forward and trust God. I can have that same kind of heart. Listen to what Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25 says. Jesus said to all of his followers, if you truly desire 
To be my disciple, you must disown your own life completely and embrace my cross as your own. So in other, ways, in other words, the old way of thinking now changes. You see, we're now in partnership with God. You see, we're in partnership with the one who is the king of kings. And we used to sing an old song, kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name, the name of Jesus, the king, the king that's above every other king, the one who, who, who will be eternal, uh, eternally reigning throughout eternity, who's alive today. That king is the one who, who I'm serving today. For if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you will discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will lose what you try to keep. Even if you gain all the wealth and power of this world and all the things it could offer you, let, yet lose your soul in the process, what good is that? I am, I am always aware of the fact as I'm just living life on this planet that God has so graciously given us the gift of and the opportunity to live on. That we, in so many cases, and I see it all around me, we live our lives in this present moment as if the things that we see in the natural are always going to be there. And we, we forget often the process of knowing God and understanding God and partnering with God that leads us to thinking eternal, eternally. Yes, I will live on this, this earth until Jesus calls me home. I understand all of that. I get that. But can I also declare over you today that as I live here, I can live for God in a way that keeps him at the forefront of my life, that keeps me moving forward, knowing that God, if you are for me, what or who can stand against me because you have your promises over my life. And that is what gives me the motivation to live with passion and to live with joy and to always be moving forward with confidence. Listen to what Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30 says, come to me all you who are weary and heavily burdened by religious rituals that provide no peace. I will give you rest, refreshing your souls with salvation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Follow me as my disciple for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest, renewal, Bless quiet for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. And then just before we celebrate communion and celebrate the work of the cross and what Jesus did for us, I want to just get you to think about this thought. I boast in the cross. I boast in the cross. I boast in what Jesus did for me. Listen to what Galatians 6.14 says. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. Could you just think about that for a moment? A whole sermon could be preached on just that thought. What do I boast in? What am I boasting in? Galatians, in Galatians, Paul says, I am not going to boast, let anything be above the fact that Jesus gave his life for me and that the cross is what is so significant in my life. There's nothing going to be ahead of that in my life. My partnership with God is what is most important. And he said, I'm going to make sure that I am boasting on the cross of Jesus. And I pray today that you will, that you will find a way to boast on the cross and, and begin to just declare what the cross means to your life, how it's changed your life. You want to impact the lives of those around you? Just talk about the power of the cross and how it has affected you and how it is, has ministered to you and, and, and how as you look to the cross, you see a, a, a Savior who, who died to give you hope. And you begin to boast in that. And you want to see people's lives change as a result of your life change? You begin to talk about what Jesus did for them and for you and how it has changed you for God's glory. Wow. You see, I want to make Jesus famous. If Jesus was willing to give so much for me, wow, how much more should I be willing to say, Lord, I just want to make you famous in this world. Wherever I go, whether it's preaching the gospel, whether it's walking through a checkout line in a store, whether it's working a job, whatever it is, God, my desire is to point people to the cross because can I tell you today, there is hope in the cross of Jesus Christ. The only hope we have in this world is a relationship with Jesus, is a relationship with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 21, he died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. So he died for every, he died for me, he died for you. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. How many can say that how differently that you know Jesus now? This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God. 
who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to himself. No longer counting people's sin against him, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation so that we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we, we could be made right with God through Christ. And that is the message of the cross. It is encapsulated right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he died for everybody. Remember, God's not willing that any should perish, so, but he died so that we all could receive this new life, that we could be born again, that we could be a new person, that the old life can be gone. See, some of us are still wrestling with the old life, and God wants us to be free from that, and it's all because of that cross. It's all because of the blood, the body of Jesus, that we now have a new life. We have a life that is free because God has brought us back, and now God has called us to bring people to him. And so that is the message of the cross today. That's the message, and, and can I say, if I look at the cross to the, the understanding of my own uh, mindset and, and my own thought processes, it's hard for me to understand, and I could say, well, how, how, how can that happen, or how did that happen? But when I understand why it happened, because God needed someone to, to just, just, just come and give their life, and that someone was Jesus who died on the cross. And then we, we who were nobodies because we are lost in sin, could now become somebodies because that one person, Jesus, gave his body to make me a somebody, and now I'm a child of God. I am a part of the kingdom of God, and now I am reconciling people into relationship with God as a result of my testimony. And so we can celebrate the cross today because we understand why it happened and we understand how it happened and it's changed our lives. And so I would encourage you today, if you're watching, you're, you're listening to this sermon and you don't know the Savior and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, I'm going to take just a moment in this, this, ser this sermon before we take communion and I want to encourage you to turn your heart toward God and I want to encourage you, I'm going to pray for you and say, Jesus, come in and be Lord and Savior of my life. I receive the sacrifice of Jesus. I received the message of the cross, and I, I received that, that, that opportunity, Lord, to be your child. I take all of that in, and God, I am going to be in partnership with you, in relationship with you, and I'm going to pray for you, and I want to encourage you, if you've never accepted Jesus, or maybe you've ran so far from God that, that you just need to find your way back, I encourage you to just, just run to him. He's a father who's reaching out to you today, and I want to pray for each one of you, and if you're listening today, and you're in relationship with God, and you're going through a deep struggle, you're, you're going through a valley today, can I tell you that even through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus is going to be with you. I believe his rod and his staff are going to comfort you. I believe that you're going to have the presence of God surround you, and I want to encourage you just to lean in on that today. Get your eyes off of the storm, as we learned last week, and get your eyes on the one who is with you in the boat. And so I want to pray right now for each of you, and then we're going to take communion together, and we're going to celebrate what the cross means to us. So Lord, I thank you for the message of the cross today. I thank you that even in our own humanity and in, at times in our uh, uh, inability to understand, Lord, we, we have so many questions. But Lord, when we begin to have a revelation of the gift and the sacrifice of who you are and what you mean to us, it begins to, to, to clear up, Lord, the, the fogginess of our lives because it just becomes so simple, the fact that God, you gave Jesus, and Jesus, you die. And Lord, as I receive you and, and respond to you, that my life is changed forever. And Lord, I pray for those who are, are watching today that maybe they've never responded to the Lord, and maybe they understand that they're lost without you because we've all sinned, and they understand today that they need a Savior. I pray that they would call on the name of Jesus, the name whereby we are saved, the name that, that, that is the name that, that we have to call on, that, that there's no other name except the name of Jesus. Jesus that brings us into that relationship 
with God the Father. And Lord, you declared that. John 14, uh, 6 declares that, that there is only one name, that whosoever calls on the name of Jesus would be saved. And I pray that we would call on that name, Lord. Those will call on the name of Jesus that need that relationship with God, that need to be saved today and born again. And Lord, that as they confess you and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior, you will come in. And Holy Spirit, you will give them peace and strength right now. You will seal this prayer in their hearts. And God, I pray that, that if there are those watching that are, that are in relationship with God and they're struggling, help Help them to remember the message of the cross, that because of the cross, we have hope. And there's nothing that, that anyone or anything can do that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, as Romans 8 declares. And I pray that today over every life in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Well, we're going to take communion together. And I want to encourage you to get those elements of communion and, and begin to, to just Get your heart turned, uh, tuned in toward um, this, uh, the, the thought of communion and what it means to us. And it is a joy today to lead it. And I want to just share a couple verses of scripture. And I want us to take communion together. I believe there's power uh, in, in taking communion. There's something very powerful that happens as we acknowledge the work of Jesus. And we understand his broken body was for our healing. His blood shed for our salvation. I want to take you back to Exodus. In the book of Exodus chapter 12, in 11 and 12, the children of Israel are getting ready to come out of Egypt, and God is uh, getting ready to bring the last plague upon the Egyptians, and he prepares a way for the children of Israel to be saved through this plague, and he tells them to take a lamb and to take that lamb's blood and to put it over the door of their home. And I'm going to read this to you, just a couple of verses, which will then take us to Matthew as we think of this Passover that I'm going to read about. That's what Jesus was celebrating when Jesus said, I will now be your Passover lamb. This is what he says. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you and destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day will be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. So shall, or you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So God was, was given instruction that, that they would annually take time to remember through the generations what God had done on this night, that, that God had passed over their homes because of the blood and they were saved from the plague and, and the destruction that the Egyptians were, were, were uh, getting, was, what was going to happen to them on that night as they were uh, seeing the firstborn uh, taken out of this world uh, of animals and their families. But the blood was over the homes of the children of Israel and God kept them. And so if you would go with me to Matthew's gospel, um, this is just prior to Jesus um, giving his life and Jesus going into Jerusalem. This is the story prior to the story that I've shared with you today. Jesus is actually celebrating this Passover that I read about from Exodus chapter 12. He's celebrating in Matthew chapter 26, and he is now saying there's going to be a, a, a different uh, lamb, and I'm going to be that lamb. And in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse uh, 26, it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take ye, this is my body. He then took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For I say to you, I want to drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And so Jesus was now establishing a new covenant. So just as they remembered the lamb uh, represented the, the sacrifice or the covering for the children of Israel on that, that Passover, that first Passover, and they celebrated every other Passover uh, uh, that would happen annually each year, they would remember it. And now we come to this point where Jesus is celebrating Passover, and he says, now I will become the lamb who will give his life. And here's what is so neat about this. When we accept Jesus as our personal savior, the sacrifice of Jesus and his blood, it covers all of our sin, and it takes care of all those things. Things that, that we have, we, we're giving to God that we need to be freed from. And God begins to come and, and live in us and through us because of the sacrifice of Jesus on a cross. When John the Baptist saw Jesus prior to him being baptized, as his ministry began walking down the road, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So think about it this way. As we take this communion, we're going to remember Jesus. Jesus said, as often as you do it, remember me. We're going to take the bread and break it and say, Jesus, Thank you for your broken body. And we're going to drink the cup and say thank you for that cup. But think about that now as that represents our covering. 
the body for our healing, for our, our peace, for our restoration, the blood for our salvation that covers us. And so I would encourage you to, to take that bread, a cracker, or whatever you have representing the body today, and I would encourage you to break that. And maybe you're with your family and begin to distribute that amongst your family members. I encourage each of you to take a piece of that bread. And this is what I'm going to pray, that, that as you receive that bread today, you will be reminded of Jesus' sacrifice, of, of the, the stripes upon his back that are for our healing. If you need healing in your body, as you receive this bread, I pray you will be healed and whole in the name of Jesus. I pray that as we take this bread, we will have a fresh, fresh revelation in our hearts of what Jesus walked through for us, and that the price is already paid, and that we can receive this healing and, and, and peace and strength in our lives. So, Lord, I thank you for the bread today. Thank you for what it means to us, God. I thank you, Jesus, that you were broken so that we could be whole. And, Lord, I thank you today that even though you didn't have to go to a cross, you didn't have to be beaten, you made the choice because you saw a, a world that was lost. You saw humanity that was separated from God, and, and you wanted to be the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. You wanted to be, once and for all, the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And Lord, I thank you today as we take this bread, we can receive peace and wholeness in our lives. We can be healed in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, if there are those watching today that have sickness in their body, I pray in the name of Jesus they would be healed. Lord, your word declares that by your stripes we are healed. And as we receive this communion today, we want to be careful to understand what the body of Jesus means to us, that because of your body, we have the opportunity to boldly go into the throne of God and declare healing and wholeness over our lives by the sacrifice of Jesus. We receive it now with thanksgiving in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's take that bread together. And just as you take it, just reflect on what the Lord has done and be thankful in your heart. I want to just take a moment and say how thankful that I am for the blood of Jesus and how it cleanses us. I'm grateful, so grateful, because what I could never do, the blood that was shed on the cross, it did for me. What I could never, what I could never work out in my own life, Jesus had already worked out over 2,000 years ago, and all I have to do is come into agreement with that. Come walk into, in, in partnership with the sacrifice of Jesus and, and acknowledge his blood that cleanses and, and uh, changes us. It cleanses us, the word says, from all unrighteousness and sets us free. And so as you hold that cup, I want to encourage you to be thankful that through one sacrifice, once and for all, Jesus paid the price for our sins. And so we remember that today. On this Palm Sunday weekend, we remember the fact that Jesus shed his blood. And I I am so thankful, so thankful for the work of the cross and the blood today. So, Lord, I thank you for this cup. I thank you that this cup represents a covenant, an everlasting covenant that, that, that we have now with God the Father through Jesus. And, Lord, as we drink this cup today, we are following the example that Jesus gave us to do it and remember his sacrifice his life, and what he means to us. And Lord, I pray as we drink this cup today, we would do it with thanksgiving, we would do it with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink the cup together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can I, can I just encourage you to take just a couple moments right there in your home, wherever you're watching, and could we just thank the Lord for the cross today? Thank the Lord that that he was crucified so that we could have life. Lord, I'm so grateful. Lord, I thank you for the message of the cross. Lord, it is in the cross that we have hope, that we have peace. Jesus, I thank you for going to that cross and willingly laying your life down. You could have Lord, you could have been caught up in the, the voice of the crowd, and you could have chosen another way, but you chose, you chose to die so that I could live, and I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that you would just continue to speak to our hearts, live through us. 
Lord, in this Easter season, I pray that we would have the, greater, uh, the greatest joy that we've ever had before as we reflect on the work of the cross and, and what it means in all of our lives today. And God, I'll be careful, we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I want to say God bless you, and I, I pray that you've enjoyed the word and uh, that you'll reflect on it as you go through this week, this week called Passion Week, as we look toward um, Good Friday and resurrection and and uh, that you'll just let this word continue to live in you and through you. And don't miss next Sunday. It's going to be uh, Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate uh, the fact that Jesus did not stay on the cross, but that he's alive. God bless you.